Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Man in America. I'm your host, Seth Holhouse. So 2023 has been a wild ride so far, especially in the financial industry. If you look at what's happening with the banking collapse, you look at what's happening with the, the BRICS nations, the de-dollarization, it seems as if everything is speeding up. And on top of that, you've got the Ukraine war, you have the uh, the neocons that seem to be constantly pushing us into war as if they need us to be in wars. And it's just it's just a wild year so far. I think it's only going to get even more crazy. Uh, so joining us today, though, is a brilliant man to help us make sense of where things are at and where they could be going. And that is Martin Armstrong. So Martin Armstrong is a financials, financial cycles expert. And he's actually much more than the financial expert. He understands geopolitics, the cycles of war, the rise and fall of civilizations. And so he's a brilliant guy to tap into right now to understand just where things are at, where they could be going, et cetera. So I hope you really enjoy this interview with Martin Armstrong. Before we jump in, though, make sure you're following me on social media platforms. It's at Man in America. And on Twitter, it's at Man in America US. And every show is done as a podcast as well. So if you'd rather listen, Just go to your favorite podcast app, search for Man in America, and you'll find me there. You can also find me over on LFA TV on Rumble. It's a great channel with a bunch of really, really good, you know, strongly, you know, great valued hosts. That's again, it's LFA TV over on Rumble. All right, folks, let's jump into this interview with Martin Armstrong. Martin, it is great to have you back on the show. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. So last time you came on, it was actually before Christmas, and we we talked about a lot about, I guess, a lot of things, but looking towards the future and you know uh, instability and looking at where we're at right now, uh, you know, with the, the bank failures, the debt ceiling, the, the Ukraine war continuing, NATO, uh, you know, just everything, the southern border, the Biden crime family, like the whole thing. It, it just seems like it's getting crazier and crazier. So. I mean, there's a million things we could start with, but what do you want to jump into to start the discussion? Well, I think what people have to understand, <clears throat> you take this whole argument over the um, the debt ceiling. Uh, there is a really serious you know, argument that people are making that Biden can invoke the 14th Amendment uh, to circumvent Congress entirely. Um, I mean, I've studied law, particularly constitutional law, and there's just no way. I mean, the 14th Amendment was written after the Civil War, and it simply says that, yes, the debt cannot be questioned, but by the South, and that the U.S. would not honor the debts of the South. So it was saying that they could not question that they had to pay taxes to pay off the debt of the North. That's what it was about. I mean, and to to claim that uh, this somehow gives Biden the the power to overrule and ignore Congress is absurd. Because um, <clears throat> then you have Article One, Section Eight that says clearly the delegation of of paying bills and debt and credit belongs to Congress, not to the president. Uh, so, you know, I don't know if we're just living in, in wonderland or <laughs> what's going on. The people even have the audacity to make this argument. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you do that and you you are basically torpedoing, you're just torpedoing the, the entire Constitution. I mean, what's the separation now between Congress and and the president? I mean, effectively, that becomes a dictatorship. Uh, So there is no pretend democracy or so, you know, what I would say that is really very concerning is that um, the Biden administration is really just occupied by a, a combination of neocons and uh, climate change uh, zealots. And in both cases, uh, <clears throat> they do not care about anything other than their goals. Uh, and 
uh, to, to say that, you know, Biden, you know, there shouldn't be any debt limit and, and we can do whatever we want is really very, very serious um, because you're you're basically tearing up the Constitution now to, to say that you want your agenda and that's it. Um, I mean, I have very good sources that everybody pretty much knows. And I was actually surprised, but Henry Kissinger just came out and said the same thing. And I know we have the same sources. Um, and my sources have been basically saying that they are definitely scared to death of Trump, uh, that the the polls show that Biden would maybe get 30 percent. I mean, that's, you know, unbelievable. But uh, <clears throat> so the. Kissinger came out and said the same thing and I've been warning about, that, that they think, uh, the neocons think if they start a war before the 2024 election, that no president has ever lost an election during a war. Um, and, I mean, it's getting pretty serious. I mean, you know, these uh, <clears throat> drones that went after the Kremlin and stuff like that, and uh, you know, the, you know, the Russians that come out and said, look, you know, Ukrainians could have done this without the the aid of the United States to begin with. Uh, it's I mean. N- normally, I would have to say this, that. <clears throat> um, Putin is not the evil emperor. You know, uh, He is the most conservative of the group. If you look really at who is threatening, you know, nuclear weapons and stuff like this, like the head of Chechnya came out and said, oh, you know, Kiev should just be nuked. And it was Putin that comes out and says, no, 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 we don't want to go there. Uh, Xi is also getting involved trying to, to reduce this, this thing. So honestly, for anybody to try and take out Putin, it's either complete uh, stupidity. Or it's a deliberate attempt, knowing that the second tier are just as neocon uh, radicals as as we have <laughs> running around Washington. Um, you do you do something like that, and they come into power. They would retaliate. I see. So, so basically, it, they're a, a big driver of this this push for war, which you can see it all over the place is that they're concerned about Trump getting back in in 2024. And so obviously we see the political persecution, the legal persecution of him. But then at the same time, if you know, if they can get us into a war, it, it kind of clears the slate and it opens up all kinds of possibilities for them, including like what you mentioned about making sure that that's one Ooh. extra thing they can do to ensure that Biden gets in again, right? So they're, so they're, so if they're that scared of Trump, I mean, it must show that they're not as weak or said they're not as strong and powerful as one might think that they are. No, they're look. Um, I mean, I've worked with uh, Washington for probably 40 years. And um, you have to understand when, <clears throat> when Reagan was elected in Washington, they were actually beside themselves. And they were saying, oh, gee, we're going to have to train him. They really don't like anybody um, who's not from Washington. And that doesn't matter if they're Republican or Democrat. It, that's, that's not the issue. Uh, it's like they don't want you know, anybody you know, from outside the neighborhood coming in and playing in their sandbox. You know? um, so <clears throat> over the years, I've watched this and... If you just go down the line and they're always some, you know, Biden's from there, Camilla's from there. I mean, that's what they want. Trump uh, was a wild card to them. And um, I can tell you the way it actually went. Uh, I used to be part of the vetting process. I would go around and meet with people who wanted to run for president. And they were said that I was there to to uh, inform them about the world economy. But it was really like, well, do you think he can smart enough to handle it? Stuff like that. Um, So 
what happens is uh, actually when Bush Jr. was going to go, they had asked me to go down and meet with him. I said, OK, fine, sure. And immediately they said, oh, but this one's different. I said, what's different? Uh, oh, he's stupid. I said, he's stupid. Um, and oh, yeah, yeah. I said, why? You know, all of a sudden we flip from is he intelligent enough to he's stupid. And that was 1999. All right. And they said, well, he's got the name. And so we can win. So then he goes in and they pick the cabinet. They're the ones who put in Cheney. And you look at the cabinets. They were all neocons, etc. They did the same thing basically with everybody, including right, right down to Donald Trump. They pretty much said, oh, look, you don't have experience. We need to put good people in, you know, so that we can give confidence to, to the world economy. And he bought that line. And then if you look at everybody that was there from John Bolton on, everyone starts stabbing him in the back. All right. And then he starts firing people back, back and forth. And I mean, I will say this, I've, I've met practically every head of state from all, over the years. Um, was good friends with Maggie Thatcher. Uh, and I did go to mar Largo to uh, to dinner there at, at Trump's place in March of 2020. And he actually impressed me. And um, and that's not easy. Right? Um, he That's when he said he wanted to pull the troops out of Afghanistan. And he said that uh, he was sick and tired of writing letters to their families to say, oh, he died for a God and country. And he actually said, he says, what are we doing there? They've been fighting over borders for a thousand years. What difference are we going to make? So John Bolton came out and, oh, this is outrageous. He fires him, etc. They always want war. Uh, and he was actually the first head of state I ever heard that was concerned about people dying on the battlefield. Uh, and, you know, then, you know, a child rose up without a father because he was killed over there or whatever. I mean, I never even heard Maggie Thatcher ever talk about that with the Falklands War. Uh, it's always, well, we got to get them, this, that. And, it, you know, it's they're doing it again. Oh, Putin is this. We have to go. How many people have to die to go get this one guy? I mean, it, it just doesn't make sense. Um, but it's, so it's all really propaganda. And that's why they're afraid of Trump, because we're actually, if Trump got in, he'd fire all the neocons again. <laughs> you know? um, so he is a, a major threat to them. Uh, so I would not put it past them uh, to pull out the standard playbook and, and create some sort of confrontation before the 2024 election. Uh, and in, in all honesty, if they can't stop Trump one way or another, I think they would assassinate him. Um, I mean, I believe, you know, that look, I mean, how many decades have to go by before we get information from the CIA on the Kennedy assassination? I mean, uh, I mean, everybody pretty much knows they did it. And <clears throat> but what are you going to do? I mean, he was against war there, too. So. It seems like anybody who's against war is conveniently removed one way or another. And Kennedy um, was just one of many, you know, uh, Gaddafi. I mean, the, the list just goes on and on and on of all the different world leaders that we've sent our own military or CIA assets in just to, to take out because they don't agree with us. So, yeah, you know, why not? Why not a president like Trump then who's a, a complete thorn in their side? Yeah, I mean, that. <clears throat> I mean, although, you know, like I said, the polls show that he would win overwhelmingly. I don't see how they could possibly allow him to get there. Um, they'll do whatever they have to, I think, in, in, in all honesty. But uh, because you're talking about they finally have um, their goal. And look, I, I knew, you know, Bill Crystal, uh, one of the neocons who wrote the book to go into Iraq. Um, and this, they really think that if you go into these countries 
overthrow the ruler that the people will cheer and they'll get some sort of a uh, you know ticker tape parade or something. And it's just not that way. Um, you can Google Tony Blair's apology for Iraq. And he even admits that, yeah, well, we thought re removing him would be OK. And then we subjected the people to sectarian violence. Uh, it, it's just. Um, I don't know, I think it goes back to to Khrushchev and his statement that we will bury you and they end up with, OK, fine, we'll, we'll put democracy around the world, you know, uh, but we don't have democracy. Um, I mean, that's all a fallacy anyhow. I mean, it in Vietnam, I mean, you, you you couldn't drink, you couldn't vote, but you were old enough at 18 to go, you know, kill people in war. So is that a democratic process when you have no right to vote uh, on should we go to war or should we not? Uh, it's This is decided by these neocons. Um, you can also Google and, and find McNamara, who was the neocon there. He did put out a book before he died. And uh, on YouTube, he's there basically, I think, trying to clear his conscience before he died. And he said, we were wrong. We thought Russia was behind them. He says, we just, you know, we were wrong. So 58,000 guys and American soldiers die because they were wrong. Um, but, I mean, this is unfortunately what we have to deal with uh why these people always want war uh i don't know i mean ron paul even came out and said the same thing i mean all we've had is endless wars and they've never won a single one of them yet um so you know this, this is it i mean then you have the climate change people who uh want to move ahead at such a rapid pace that we don't have a power grid to to handle everybody's cars being electric, you know, and um, they, you know, it's when they were forming the Euro, they they came to me they, and I met with them and they were selling that as, oh, everybody will pay the same interest rate. And I said, this is not going to work this way. Um <clears throat> They were trying to, to give the image of the United States. I said, yes, the dollar has a single interest rate for the federal government only. Every state has a different credit rating. And was like, Shh, you know, don't say that, please. You know? And I said, this is going to fail. And they said, well, we just have to get the euro in. Then we'll worry about the debt problem later. And of course, they never did. Um, but they always just rush into things. Uh, and so now in Europe, you have, you know, people complaining, oh, well, this, you know, Greece is paying more than, than Italy and Italy's paying more than Germany. And, you know, I told them, you're just going to move the currency for, you know, volatility from the currency market to the bond market. Um, you know, it's, I think that's just common sense. And so uh, you're going to buy a debt based upon the credit rating of, of each state. All right, folks, I've got a quick message for you. I have one simple question. If today you could no longer go purchase more food for your family with the food stores that you have in your home, how long would you be able to feed your family? Would it be a week, three weeks, a month, two months, a year? This is a really important question, folks, that we have to be very realistic about because the elites are proactively trying to put us into a state of food crisis and a state of famine. I'm sure you've seen all of the different food processing plants and farms that are blowing up. You've got cattle dying by the tens of thousands. They're proactively trying to collapse our food system because they know if they can control our food, they can control us. And so one of the best ways to be outside of their control is to be able to have our own stores of food and to be able to produce our own food. So there's really two things I would recommend. One is having heirloom seeds that you can grow your own food with, making sure that they're non-GMO heirloom seeds, that that way you can harvest your seeds this year, use them next year. You can use these seeds for generations. Literally, that's how it will work. 
The other thing though, is this high quality storable food. This is food that's sitting somewhere. It's hidden in your basement, buried in your backyard, whatever whatever it is. So that way, if there is a crisis, if there is an emergency, you might have three months set aside to get through that time period. And so for this, I would highly recommend a company called Heaven's Harvest. This is an amazing Christian owned Patriot company. And what they're doing is they're making high quality storable food. Again, a lot of the food companies, they say these food buckets, they're all about maximizing calories per dollar. They're filling the buckets with a bunch of filler and junk, like sweet beverages, et cetera. But Heaven's Harvest, they focus on very high quality food that will last up to 25 years on the shelf. They also sell heirloom seeds. You can buy all of your seeds. You can buy all of your storable food. And look, folks, personally, I would recommend having at least three months per person in your household, if not six months or even a year. Again, depends on your budget, but I would definitely make sure you have some seeds because that seed, those seeds could be worth their weight in gold, if not more in the future. So to go ahead and do this right now, go put up a new tab and go to heavensharvest.com. And if you use the promo code Seth, that's S-E-T-H, promo code Seth, you'll save 15% off of your entire order. So again, folks, the time is running out and you'd rather be three months or one year early than one day late. Again, heavensharvest.com and use promo code Seth to save 15% today. With what's happening with the banking system, right? We had SVB, then we had a signature and a handful of other banks, you know, and it seems like every, you know, a bank fails, they come out and tell us, Everything's fine, whether it's Jamie Dimon or Jerome Powell or Yellen. It's all oh, the banking system is so strong. It's it's perfect. And then there are bank fails. They come out and say, oh, it's so strong and it's perfect. Yet it seems like it's really unraveling. So, I, I mean, looking at the big picture of the banking system and the loss of confidence in the banks, the fact that we're having more money that's exiting banks than ever before in history is because people are moving them into other assets. They're losing trust. Where do you see this ending up? I mean, do you think that we're going to continue to see this cascade and, and kind of go out of control until it gets too big to control? Well, that's part of the digital currency move um, that if you uh, move it to digital, then, you know, you can't go up to the bank and say, you know, give me all my money and here's put it in this paper bag, you know. Um, so that's part of it. <clears throat> but you know, in all honesty, you know, the people who have been behind a lot of the decisions, uh, even at central bank level, um, it's pathetic. I mean, you had Draghi in Europe take interest rates to negative in 2014. And I even warned them this this is this is insane. You can't do this. All right. So interest rates remain negative for, for over eight years. So every bond that all the European governments have issued since 2014 are down anywhere between, you know, 30 to 40 percent if they had to sell them. And you take the in the United States. The problem, SVB and Republic Bank, et cetera. Um, and most of these smaller banks are, they really got wrapped up in this woke nonsense that um, you look at SVB, they, you know, the risk managers they put in, okay, well, we need a woman. Not that she's qualified. Um, you look at the board members and the board members at SVB were basically just political donors to, to the, the Democrats. Not one had any banking exp- And this is a real problem because what happened is then you have the, the fake news under control, it's going to go down. And you have these people without experience in a lot of these small banks just believing whatever they read in the newspaper. So they didn't hedge. They had no understanding of even what hedging is. Uh, And I mean, I'll give you an example. I mean, I was actually called in 
uh, when they were creating the euro, and Britain was going to stay out. Mercedes ended up shorting the British pound because all the newspapers said, oh, the pound is going to fall. It's not part of the euro, et cetera, right? Well, of course, the opposite happened. <laughs> People didn't trust the euro, and they moved to the pound, and the pound went up. So uh, we got called into Mercedes. They had lost a billion dollars because they hedged, uh, thinking the pound would go down. And I asked them, I said, why did you get into this trade? And they actually said to me, well, that's what, you know, was on the headlines all the time. Um, and then <clears throat> they asked me to go meet with the board of Daimler-Benz. They said, because they got the same, same trade. So I went to go meet with them. Uh, and the board made its hedging decisions. They didn't even have a financial team at all. They made their hedging decisions based upon what they read in the newspapers. And then because they had gotten it wrong so many times, they passed a rule that once they put a hedge on, they'll just let it expire. So uh, at the last day of the fiscal year, Daimler-Benz and Mercedes were suddenly merged and everybody was shocked. It's because we got Mercedes out of the, their loss. Uh, Daimler had a billion dollar loss, which they want to show. The two of them were merged together and it was very neatly hidden. Uh, and this is the way it, it is. I mean, no matter some of the biggest companies that I've gotten called into, that unsophisticated. So here you have interest rates down artificially for so long. All right. So then you have bonds. And the way a bank makes money, it, it basically takes the, a demand deposit and invests it long term. The spread, very nice. Uh, interest rates were virtually zero. So they were getting all this money for free. And then they were buying long term bonds. Well, what happens? Long term interest rates went up. All of a sudden, if they need to sell the bond, they have to take a huge loss. And the money that they used is from demand deposits. So you can walk in there and say, I want it now. That's the banking system. All right. When you artificially took rates so low, the banks got addicted to this, like it was heroin or something. The money was free. Uh, so Buying long term at one and a half, two percent max, that was a, a windfall for them. Now it's coming back to the opposite way. So the other thing I will say, which I don't really want to scare people, but um, the 2008 to 2009 crisis was mortgage backed securities. So the banks that got in trouble were the ones that had those. This time, this is affecting all banks. Substantially different than 08 to 09. All right. Now, <clears throat> that means it's largely the smaller banks that get, um, you know, the biggest risk because <clears throat> they didn't have any professional people. Uh, and that's the real crisis. So and so, do you think that we're, on the edge of something that is far worse than what we what we experienced in 2008 2009 well yes i mean i don't want to scare people but i mean you, <clears throat> the other problem is is that uh it sounds very nice this 250 guarantee blah 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 okay uh i mean i was on the phone literally screaming at some of the people involved in decision making and say, you have to cover all, absolutely every deposit. Well, why? I say, because if you wipe out <clears throat> the small business that's going to have more than 250 there just for payroll, all right, now you're putting so many small business employees, 70% of, of the workforce. You take those out. So in other words, every small business that has more than 250,000 would lose it? 
I said, you're going to be talking about a major banking crisis because I'd have to advise them, get your money the hell out of a bank. Um, and then I don't know. I mean, you get these people in these positions and they have zero experience in the financial world. And honestly, it was like their mouth just dropped. They're like, really? That would happen? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, it, it's, it, it's just mind boggling. Uh, we don't have the expertise at government or or central banks. I mean, we need you know qualified people. You can't just you know be hiring somebody because of their race creed. You know, I need uh, three more women. You know, do they can they do the job? Well, that's irrelevant. You know, um, do you then think you say that- oh. Do you think that we would uh, see bail-ins? Because I know that there's been some discussion about that. Do you think that it could get to a point where either the banks are are, are seizing assets from the the customers to stay afloat, or the government would seize anything from the the people to keep the banking industry alive? Oh, there have been definitely discussions of doing that because it, it um, and I I've been warning them. I said you. If you go down this road, you're wiping out small business. Unemployment is going to shoot to probably 20, 25 percent. Uh, and you talk about a Great Depression, that will look like a dress rehearsal. Uh, it, you, you know, the stupidity of people at this level is it, just mind boggling. Um, and, you know, sometimes they just put out total BS. I mean, like yelling, oh, well. Well, we're we're only going to you know go after the billionaires and and track six hundred dollars that on on eBay. I don't think you know Elon Musk is selling some used bicycle for six hundred dollars on eBay. Um, I mean, this is absurd. I mean, it, it hiring eighty seven thousand IRS agents for what to go after the the rich? The rich are the ones that basically. Eh, any business, you have to have law firms and, and accountants in place just to deal with it. Uh, so the only people that they would possibly be able to target are the small business people and anybody who is making money on the side on eBay or whatever. I mean, this is, you know, the, the, the lies that come from them are, are really just too much. Um, do you think that they? I was actually, you know, sir, go ahead. Go ahead. I was, was going to say, do you think that they want this system to collapse because it becomes the perfect opportunity to bring in their central bank digital currency, which gives them all the control they've always wanted? There are definitely people that push for that. Um, what what you have to understand is is they also are pushing for war. Why? Because um, they have actually had discussions that a war gives them the ability to default on all the debt, start all over, and create Brenton Woods too. Um, the IMF has come out with its digital, you know, currency, uh, and their objective is to replace the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency. So, I mean, all these plans are there. It's not conspiracy theory. Um, uh, it's just that how do they implement it? That's that's the main question. And and that seems to come back to, you know, if we can just create some sort of a war, then that's the justification for, because, uh, you know, all Europe defaulted on is dead after World War One, World War Two. I mean, this is what they do. Um, you go to war, I mean, the, uh, the American Revolution. The Constitution said that they would honor all the debts of the continental currency. They didn't. You can still buy continental currency, you know, on eBay if you want. Um, they never honored that either. So, I mean, it's just the way, you know, things happen. And where do you think the BRICS nations fit into this? Because they also seem to be aggressively advancing their you know, plans and, and they're kind of push for a replacement to the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency with uh, their currency. And they also seem to be 
And like what we're witnessing right now is a massive de-dollarization of the world. We have nations all over completely turn their back on the United States, even though a lot of the oil producing nations are. I mean, how does this fit in? And it, I mean, what are, what, what's the, how is that going to affect the dollar? Because as I understand, our dollar has had its strength and stability because of oil producing nations, because we're the world reserve currency, but that's all being undone rapidly. Well, Completely collapsed. That's it. It's not backed by gold. And the dollar went up. So they had to come up with an excuse. Well, why is the dollar going up when it's no longer backed by gold? So then they came out, oh, it's it's because of the oil. All of that is very nice. It's just propaganda. Um, the real story here is that the wealth of the nation is not its gold, not oil, not commodities. It's its people. The United States has the largest consumer um, economy in the world. And so what's happened is that that's how Europe came back, China, Japan, uh, from the ashes, basically, by making things to sell to Americans. Uh, so it's the American consumer. Uh, so all this brick talk is very nice um but it's again irrelevant if they um when say oh we're going to reject the dollar blah 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 all the rest of this stuff then the problem becomes <clears throat> if they think that they can sell their product in their currency and not dollars to the american consumer then it's going to fluctuate um and uh, Honestly, I, I was involved in that as well. The Japanese, how you know, um, I explained to them and they listened. All right, how did they beat the German cars in the seventies? I said, look, the only way to do that is you price it in dollars, you take the risk of the currency back, and you manage it. And that's what they did. Um, then German cars went up in price dramatically in the 70s because they were pricing their cars in Deutschmark. And as the dollar appreciated, it was all currency moves. Um, that's why I got called into the by the Germans. Okay, fine. You did this for the Japanese. Now do this for us. Okay. Um, so if you're taking the bricks and you're going to take your product and you're not going to sell it in dollars, you're going to say, oh, you're going to have to pay here in, in whatever, in Indian rupees. Very nice. But you're now telling the American the foreign exchange risk is yours. That's not going to fly. All right. So I know a lot of people talk about this BRICS thing and that's, you know, very nice and all oh, it's oil and this. They need to sell to the American consumer. Just look at the facts. All right. Um, what percentage of the world economy is energy? It's, it's less than 10 percent. The bulk of it is consumer oriented. So you also take the take the look at Germany. All right. And you can look at the stats. Germany's the strongest economy. Very nice. But they used a mercantile uh, theory. Get rich by selling things to everybody else. So they kept very high taxes. And if you look at the German citizen, they're worth less than an Italian. All right. But they have the strongest economy because they also have the highest taxes. All right. So um whereas china will surpass the us economy there's no question about that but china has looked at this very carefully china is 
attempting to create a their own consumer based economy. All right, whereas Europe is not. All right, so they have looked at what made the United States successful. It was a consumer economy. All right, so China will surpass the United States. And ultimately, after 2032, fine, I think you'll be looking at the strongest economy will be the Chinese one. But uh, it's not because of oil and things of this nature. They are strategically rebuilding the this, this Silk Road. They are strategically building their own domestic uh, consumer economy. They uh, are not stupid. They know what they're doing. Whereas Europe is more caught up in Marxism and socialism and all this. You know, it's um, quite. uh, It has really seriously suppressed their economic growth uh, over the years. Uh, And it's. It's just the way it is. I mean, it, you know, I love Europe. I've spent, you know, decades going, you know, living there, going back and forth. Um, but, you know, I would, you know, one person, I was doing an interview at a, in a press there, I think actually in Paris. Um, and they said, you know, that your forecast that the EU would not be able to beat, you know, the United States. I said, correct. Uh, why you say that? I said, because you don't understand what made the United States. I said, <clears throat> um, it was actually discrimination. What do you mean discrimination? Whoever was the last off the boat was always discriminated against until they spoke English. <laughs> All right. So you ask an American, what are you? Oh, I'm half German, half Irish, whatever. Well, you don't see that in Europe. You know, I mean, sure, there are some exceptions, but... um uh, you, you, you know, I met people that are Scottish and and, and mothers Italian, etc. You would never see that because they don't speak the same language. What made America great was the fact that everybody ended up having to speak the same language. So, uh, like, I can't hire somebody to answer the phone in the office that only speaks Spanish. You know, you know, it's it's you got to be able to to deal with the customer on the other side. So often it, you know, it is, uh, you know, the problem of we get together and as long as we consolidate everything, then the economy grows. Like, like this wokeness stuff is very bad because it divides everybody. And uh, <clears throat> so you start saying, oh, it's them, it's this, that. I mean, that's pretty much what Hitler did. Um, oh, the Jews, this, and and all of a sudden it goes from the you know the Jewish bankers, then it goes to the Jewish uh, store owners. Oh, to hell with it, just get all the Jews, you know. Uh, it, you know when you start you know taking groups and you you point the finger at them for one thing or another, then you separate them, and it's when the people are uh, basically collective. Uh, then the government has trouble. You can also Google, because it came out uh, in the lawsuit, I think it was in Alabama against uh, Amazon. Uh, And the papers that got released was that um, they called it a diversity index, that they wanted to keep their workforce as diverse as possible. So they don't combine together. So the blacks don't get together with the whites, the Spanish stay. As long as everybody stays in their own little group, then they don't band together and create a union. This is what the paper, and and that is actually um, how governments function. If you keep the people divided, then they will not join together, come up and get you. (laughs) As simple as that. Which is why it just seems like we're constantly being hit with the device of you know race wars, straight versus gay, you know Christian versus atheist, I mean black versus white. I mean it's they're constantly keeping us divided. Um, 
so I want to go back and take a step back and look at the the banking stuff because so I I had uh, Dr. Charles Ninner on in the past you know couple of months and you know what something that his cycles were pointing out was he was saying that by fall he expected the stock market will probably lose upwards of forty percent by fall now. If you're you know talking and we're looking at like what you mentioned that okay 2008 2009 it was the banks that were heavily leveraged with you know um, mortgage backed securities right and now it's something mm-hmm. that is it's all the banks so what do you see unfolding and, and you know, I, I think that in terms of not wanting to scare people I think a lot of the audience is watching this show. I've probably scared them with much worse because I tend to be someone that's like, well, <laughs> let's look at how bad it could be and then we'll figure out how we can position ourselves, right? Um, so, I, I, you know, so where do you, because <clears throat> if if this makes potentially the Great Depression look, look like a dress rehearsal, what sh- what what could that look like, right? What might people expect to happen? All right, well, <clears throat> you're, that, forecast that the Dow would be down 40% or whatever, that um, you have to understand why something like that is less likely. Because when a stock market crashes, we call it a flight to quality. So where does the money go? It goes to government bonds, T-bills, etc. Now, In this situation, it's the government that's the problem. So are you going to sell your IBM stock and run out and buy government bonds? Uh, I don't think that scenario works this time. So the people that are forecasting that, uh, by that very forecast means you sell the asset and you go to cash and you're going to bonds. Why would you do that if the problem is the cash and the bonds? So where do you go? Uh, like what what happens? <laughs> basically, it, it goes in the opposite direction. This is a time where private assets rise. Now, that is <clears throat> uh, real estate, it's stocks, uh, precious metals, uh, anything that is... Um, The movable things are probably the best, Uh, even collectibles. um, I mean, some of the the ancient coins that, I mean, I've been shocked. I mean, the last one like would sell for, you know, three or four hundred thousand dollars, bringing, you know, three million dollars. It's like, what is going on? (laughs) You know, um, you hear, I mean, you know, outrageous prices for the first comic book of, you know, of uh, Superman, stuff like this. Um, I mean, I'm in Florida and I get, I would say, at least three phone calls a week. Gee, you want to sell your house? Uh, No, I don't. Where am I supposed to go? You know, Chicago? No, thank you. (laughs) You know, Um, now you also have a problem of we have a migration issue as well. Whereas people are fleeing the blue states, particularly California, uh, Illinois, uh, New York, and they're moving to Texas and Florida. I mean, I can tell you, I mean, this is, it's crazy here. I mean, the, the, um, the traffic has certainly doubled in six years. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I talk to real estate friends of mine down here and they're saying, you know, houses are like, you know, one to three million people are coming in paying cash. Uh, so it's clearly it's what we call people just trying to get money off the grid. Um, what do you do with it? If you've got, you know, three or four million dollars sitting in a bank account, do you just leave it there? If the bank goes down, you're not going to get more than 250. Uh, do you want to go out and buy 30 year bonds uh, when the interest rates keep going up and maybe somebody doesn't want the bonds? Um, you know, so basically, it, it's a very difficult situation, and it's mostly going into the private sector, uh, and and that's why I seriously doubt that you would see the Dow down 40, 50 percent, because for that to happen, you would have to go someplace else. The other uh, thing is that the amount of money in the debt market 
is generally 10 times that of the equity market. So it doesn't even take that much coming out of the bond market to say, well, gee, maybe I should get something a little bit, you know, different, you know. Um, then you have the war situation. And, <clears throat> um, you know, I, I've said, you know, when I created this model, it was just largely tracking capital flows. And back in the 80s, we had a client was Universal Bank of Lebanon, and they asked if we could, you know, they found a ledger where somebody wrote the Lebanese pound down every day um, <clears throat> into the, you know, mid-1800s, and could we build a model? I said, sure, okay, fine. So we stuck it in, and out came and said, your country, you know, I called them, because I thought something was wrong. I said, it says your country's going to fall apart in eight days. So I said, something, you know, something's got to be wrong with the data. And very calmly he said, well, what currency would you recommend? And I thought that was a very strange way to respond to what, what I thought was an outrageous forecast. Uh, and I said, well, it says the Swiss franc. Eight days later, the Civil War began. We had another client who was a big shipper out of Saudi Arabia. And he called me and he says, uh, Iran is going to start attacking shipping in the Gulf tomorrow. What do you think gold's going to do? I said, well, it says it's going up. Um, so by the time we got to 1998, I began to understand if you know you're going to do war, uh, you start moving your money in advance. Uh, so we put out. You know, it ended up being on the front page of the London Financial Times in June of 98. It said that Russia was going to collapse in about 30 days. That was the long term capital management crisis, the whole thing. Um, and so the point is, I've warned that if we're going to go into war with China, and then they are going to start selling US debt. They've been doing that every month, selling tens of billions of dollars. Uh, you don't own the, the, the debt and fund your opponent to wage war against you. So the bond market has this other albatross around its neck. And the more we move towards war, the more you will see China divest itself of U.S. debt. So that also keeps pressure on interest rates to go higher as well. So it, it's we live in a very complex, dynamic global economy, and you can't reduce everything down to a single you know cause and effect, uh, like the climate change people. Oh, everything's CO two. I think there's something a little bit more involved here. You know, uh, it's never just one thing. Uh, and the same thing on finance. I mean, we got to look at, okay, if we're going to keep jawboning China, then they are going to sell the debt. If they sell the debt, that's going to push the interest rates up higher on this side. If you're going to be looking at um, the government not paying uh, small businesses, or that, that would then create a depression. Uh, but probably more so in the uh, small companies rather than the big companies. Uh, I, you know, because that's where the politicians have their money, you know. So um, uh, we have to understand that we, we're, everything is connected. Absolutely everything is connected. We can't uh, say it's just one thing. So I don't see the stock market crashing 40, 50%. Uh, it, you know, to do that, you're going to have to have, um, Basically, a banking failure where they decide to allow all the small com you know, companies to go bust. I don't see that before 2024. Um, I think Biden will uh, cancel the currency after the election. Uh, I don't think they would do that beforehand. Um, they're definitely going to uh, push out the the central bank digital currency uh, from uh, July forward. Uh, and even that's connected to the 5G. Why are we going to 5G? Because they need faster uh, speed so that you can instantaneously transfer money uh, right then and there. 
You pay a store. Okay, fine. Here, the store's got to know that the money's good instantly. All right. You're, you don't, you're not going to have a $50 bill to give somebody. All right. So, um, the ramifications of that are are very profound. They go further off. I mean, you see a guy, you know, with a sign, I'm homeless. How do you give him money? You know, do you have a digital card? You know, um, all that's out. I mean, how do you hire the 16-year-old girl next door to, to be the babysitter? You know, um, it, it's... <clears throat> You know, they talk about, oh, we'll end, uh, you know, all crime and prostitution, et cetera. You know, um, you, the implications of eliminating cash are far greater than I think people really suspect. And do you um, think that they'll be successful in doing that? Or do, I mean, because it seems like whenever the government tries to do something, something big, especially look at Obamacare, look at all the different things they've tried to do. It always fails. And I, I can't think of a more complex operation than getting rid of the getting rid of cash as a as a currency and replacing it with the you know digital currency. So do you think that they will succeed? Or do, I mean I right? It's like when they, they brought the euro in and a lot of uh, other countries still they you know have people that use their local currencies. So I mean, how would they Now, U.S. had to go out and start a campaign internationally to say that they're still good because everybody else just can't. And they can't, the, 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 you know, I suppose they would, they would redeem them. Um, but I mean, this is the way, you know, it, it functions. Uh, outside the United States, they routinely cancel currency. I mean, like I said, even Trudeau just did it in Canada. Uh, so Americans, it's strange. Um, but U.S. wants to give it a shot. Will it succeed? I think it will cause more civil unrest and a lack of confidence um, in the United States domestically and internationally. Because once they do that, then the dollar will not be the reserve currency. You can't hold it overseas as a as a check and balance against your government. So um, you know, and and even then, you have to you know when they do this. Um, digital currency, um, they will also wipe out all, you know, cryptocurrencies. Uh, you have to understand this is a, you know, they're not going to allow Bitcoin to survive. Uh, that's competition. 
you know, it, the object here is to get, uh, they're after all cash transactions for taxes. All right. So why would you then allow uh, any cryptocurrency to exist, which would still be the same thing as cash? You're going to eliminate the cash. They're eliminating the, the digital, you know, cryptocurrency side as well. They don't want any competition. And their view, uh, just like Yellen was saying, oh, we're going to have to audit $600. $600. Um, how much are you, you know, you're going to really get? But they sit there uh, and think that we are all just scum. Uh, they really look down upon us as, as some sort of an ant farm. And uh, we, you know, they wouldn't have a problem if we all obeyed everything and uh, paid every tax that they ever dreamed of. This is really their, their view. I mean, I've been in meetings and argued. And in Canada, I, I was completely dumbfounded. The response was, well, what we earn is really theirs. They decide what we're allowed to keep. This is how far the left has gone. Uh, that we're just economic slaves to them. Uh, human rights, all that's out the window. It's like, um, I don't know. I mean, I, it's, it's the most... Marxism basically has been responsible for more deaths than anything, any theory ever devised by man. I mean, hundreds of millions of people died just si simply within the communist revolutions. Uh, and they just never stop. Um, I mean, just look at the eight points from the WEF from Klaus Schwab. I mean, democracy has, has they don't even want that. Um, you can Google, there was the FT when Trump was elected, it was, they were all upset. It was like, suddenly democracy became populism. Populism was evil. Why is it evil? Oh, because it's against career politicians, <laughs> you know? Um, so it, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, you take Ukraine, oh, we're fighting for democracy. Well, the Minsk agreement said that. The dumb boss was supposed to get elections and be allowed to vote. So where is this a battle for democracy? It's not. It's it's but you know, they look, they they've been lying about things for a long time. And and just look at every war. It's uh it tapes her out now by you know from LBJ. Uh we were never attacked by the Vietnamese, and and he says for all he knew. They were shooting at whales that night. But 58,000 people of, of our guys died for whales. Um, weapons of mass destruction never existed. I mean, just go on and on and on. I mean, it's they say whatever they need to say to achieve their immediate goal. That's it. Yeah, you're... You're absolutely right. I mean, the you know, the Pearl Harbor, which they knew about ahead of time. I mean, all of these became justifications for their for their wars. Um, do you have time for one more question? Is that okay? Are you sure? Oh, okay. Well, it's it's actually it's kind of two questions put together. One is uh, the, the we're seeing uh, you know central banks and a lot of the bigger uh, you know, governments et cetera, that that are buying gold uh, in record numbers. And I want to see what your thoughts are as to why they're doing that. And then the other question, it kind of relates to it is, do you think that we could ever see an act of 1933 again, where say when the government wants to transition to a central bank digital currency, that they would actually seize the precious metals from the hands of the people? Um, <clears throat> the reason you see... Uh, China, Russia, etc., going for gold. Uh, it's not that you're returning to a gold standard, and it's not even that they think gold's going to go up. It's what I'm talking about is you do not hold the the currency of your opponent. All right, because basically, uh, look, I mean, they just seized private assets if you were Russian. 
That's it. We just took yachts and everything. They can do whatever they want. There is no rule of law. So if China's sitting there with, you know, trillion dollars worth of stuff, uh, we're not going to honor that. You're going to eat it. This is why they're going to gold. Okay. It's not that they think gold's going to go up or down or whatever. And so it's not bullish from like a, a standpoint of price. It's neutrality. Okay. That's what they're um, interested in. Uh, and you can't go with the euro. You can't go with the dollar. Um, <clears throat> Canada is too small anyhow, and they're just as crazy as any. <laughs> so is Australia. Uh, Britain, <clears throat> same thing. So where do you go? Uh, so that's why you see some of these central banks buying gold. Like I say, it's got nothing to do with being bullish or bearish or anything else. It's just being neutral and they get rid of everything else because the West is not um, trustworthy. Um, <clears throat> just look at the Mintz Agreement. I, I couldn't believe it that you can Google that and somebody asked, well, why don't you know, ask Merkel, why didn't uh, they force Ukraine to, to honor the Minsk agreement. And she actually responded, well, we never really intended that. We, we just did that to do, you know, Russia, to give, you know, Ukraine time to build it, an army. It was like, excuse me? Why would anybody then enter any treaty with you ever again if you're, you don't honor what you say? I mean, I, I couldn't believe that response. It was just mind boggling. Then how would you then say, okay, Russia, we're ready for a peace agreement? Should they trust it? I mean, it, I mean, I couldn't believe that a head of state would have ever responded in such a, a reckless manner of that. So why should China or Russia or anybody else enter any agreement on anything uh, if if we don't honor it? So. Um, I don't think, you know, when, in 1933, when they confiscated gold, <clears throat> what they did was they went after uh, all the institutions. So if you have your gold in a storage facility, yes, they could take that. They know where it is. But they did not come knocking on everybody's doors and saying, give me every you know, $20 gold piece you got in your sock drawer. Um, that's why so many of them have have survived. All right. Um, but if you had there are a number of, of, of Supreme Court cases on this, that people challenged that. And um, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the government, they, you know, the gold clause cases. Uh, you say, well, I, you know, deposited. Uh, twenty dollars in gold, and I should get twenty dollars in gold back. And they said, no, twenty dollar bill is just as good. Um, so I don't think that they would confiscate going down to um, as it. At, you know, back home and, and pay the fees to get it out of there? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I think that when these people realize that it is the uh, alternative to what they're doing, uh, then they will start attacking it. Uh, Um, I, there's always a black market that emerges. Um, so I would expect that, um, uh, to happen, uh, where maybe gold and silver basically are the, uh, <clears throat> underground currency of that. 
and what they'll do is they'll make it illegal for you to do a transaction in gold or something along those lines. Um, they're never afraid about passing any, you know, any crazy laws. Um, I mean, just look at what they're actually proposing that Biden should should pardon Hunter. I mean, uh, you know, that's like really okay, fine. So the allegations go back to you yourself. So now you're you're um, giving yourself a pardon while, while you're at the rest. Of, I mean, it, it's just the conflicts of interest are like. Don't you people care about even that anymore or what? Um, so it just seems like everything's just beyond uh, any rational contemplation anymore. And the, the year's just starting. <laughs> that's, that's certainly true. Well, I, I thank you for the time that you've given me today. Um, before we sign off, I do want to bring up your website, which is Armstrong Economics.com. So I, I really encourage folks to come on here. And I know that you offer a lot of services and guidance, right? So what will people find on your website? Well, the, the website is uh, completely free. You don't even have to register to get in and we don't sell advertising. Um, <clears throat> Socrates is a fully functioning artificial intelligence system. It's the only one in the world. Uh, and it writes over a thousand uh reports every day on everything that uh, imaginable. Uh, real estate, uh, individual stocks, precious metals. Um, and it, it's all the stock markets around the world. I mean, and it's covering economic statistics. So, so this is all, um, like I say, it's a fully functioning AI system that is confined to just the world financial economy. It's not going to answer, you know, what's Lady Gaga's, you know, dog's name. But um, uh, that's, you know, it's unbiased that way. It's it's nobody else is in in there um, changing anything, you know, you know, whatever. So it it's it's very uh, it's non biased, not prejudicial in any way, and. That's what's making it so uh, attractive around the world. Uh, uh, it's covering markets that nobody else even covers. So uh, gold silver ratios are there. Uh, I mean, you know, even the Dow gold ratios are there. I mean, everything imaginable. Um, you know, it's I mean, you can gain access to for I think even just fifteen dollars a month or something. We try to make it some things open for the average person. Um, but this was all started just for institutions. So, um, or, you know, we've opened it up to try and help society as much as possible. I see. Okay. And, and this, that website is ask hyphen Socrates.com. And then also Martin, uh, or sorry, Armstrong economics.com. So Martin, Thanks again for having you know for coming on the show. Uh, I, I think that in say three or four more months, there's going to be a lot more to talk about. So maybe we'll do another one of these because I think it's going to be a pretty yeah. wild summer. <laughs> it's it's definitely um, 2023 was supposed to be a very critical turning point on uh, according to our computer, and we've just started. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but. Yeah. It, by the time we get through the summer and and the fall, I mean, it, it's going to be very interesting to say the least. It is. Well, thanks again. Take care and have a wonderful rest of your day. All right. Thank you. All right, folks. I hope you enjoyed.
Yeah, and it was uh, it was good seeing you in Miami as well for the reawaken event. I mean, it was uh, uh, you know just uh, obviously a, a big event, lots of energy, a lot of people waking up, and you always leave those events feeling just inspired and you know having more hope for the nation. Well, that's what it's all about, right? I mean, Clay does such an amazing job on bringing everybody together, like topic after topic, whether it's the economy or health or things or spiritual side, right? Politics, bringing it all together, because a lot of times it feels like we're alone in this battle, right? But when you come away from that, it's like, oh my word, I'm not alone. There's thousands of people that just came to this event that think like me around the country, you know, it's got to be people are waking up everywhere. And that's, I, that's what I feel er, whenever I leave any one of those, because I go to a lot of them, is there is hope. There's people fighting. This is for our freedoms, right? Our personal freedoms, our economic freedoms, our health freedoms, our religious freedoms, all of them, right? And it's just an amazing thing to go to. But yeah, we, uh, we had a great time there. Uh, we love seeing you. We loved being with the other show hosts that were on. Loved meeting all of our clients there because there's a lot of them. And uh, it was just, it was just really a good weekend. Yeah, it, it really was. And it was interesting because you could see and talking to a lot of people there, you mentioned, you know, kind of the feeling of being alone. And that was something that gave me encouragement because a lot of people, they told me in the feedback and talking to the audience members, they said, look, you know, it's, it's shows like yours that make me feel less alone. Like I can't have these conversations with my family. I can't talk about this with my spouse or my children. But having being able to tune in and listen to a conversation between you and they mentioned your name a handful of times as well, people that just see things the same, it really, it really helps them. Um, right. Yeah. But some, some crazy right. things are certainly continuing to unravel though amidst all this. And, uh, and, you know, keep in mind that my perspective is that I have a lot of hope for the American people and for our future, especially for the good people. But I also want to be really just very sober about where things are at. And, you know, because, you know, you and I have really, you know, kind of honed in on the, on the economic aspect of our world. And I've learned so much from you. Um, I think that we should continue just really trying to wrap our heads around what's happening, uh, especially as we're looking at the continuing bank runs, because as much as they're telling us that everything is okay, all the indicators are showing the opposite and there's actually a warning from a, a pretty big hedge fund manager that we're going to get into that I think is like is shocking to say the least. But let's go ahead and start with this article that you sent me about PacWest, right? This is another one of the big banks that we've been eyeing and how their shares continue to tumble. Actually, um, I've got a little chart down here where you can see <laughs> that you do not want your stocks to look like that. Right. Like that looks like it's the opposite of what happened to the votes for Joe Biden. Right. <laughs> it's yeah. just like yeah. a vertical line down. Um, but what they're saying, though, with this is that, you know, there's just as news from late last week that their shares dropped another 20 percent and they're already down 80 percent. But after mm -hmm. bank deposits fell nine point five percent. So almost 10 percent of all of their bank deposits in the last week fled that banking system. So what can you, what can you make of that? Well, when you think about why banks fail, it's, it's pretty easy. They have more withdrawals than they do deposits. I mean, it, it just boils down to that. And, but this problem, like we've talked about before, goes back to March of 2020 when the Federal Reserve changed the reserve requirement to zero because banks don't have to have anything on hand. Well, Kirk, why is it stupid? Why would they do that when they have to write checks and, you know, people have checks and savings account withdrawals and everything that they do? Well, the lower the reserve requirement goes, the more a bank can lend out. So there's or more money that they can use to invest, right? So it's in the bank's best interest and to try to stimulate the economy, because if you lend out a ton of money, like all of it, you've got all that money kind of working for you. Well, where this becomes a real problem is when people's wages are declining, prices going up, people can't afford to live like we have right now, then a 0% reserve requirement, which they use to try to stimulate the economy and get more people to purchase, it doesn't even matter. I mean, you could probably put the, the interest rates to negative 
And if people don't have money, they simply don't have money. They're tapped out. It doesn't matter if interest rates were negative 15%. They're still not going to spend because they don't have it. And the other part of that problem is banks have no liquidity. I mean, as we've seen over the last, since the beginning of this year, you know, over the last five months, the basically M2 money supply is shrinking. It's not growing, it's shrinking, which means that not just are people pulling money out of the system, but because it's shrinking more than that, right? We can tell. It's down by $500 billion, half a trillion in the first four months of this year. That's basically the Fed pulling money out of circulation. Not all of that is people getting out of Dodge and going somewhere else. That's way too big of a number for that. So the Fed is simply pulling money out of circulation in exchange for a central bank digital currency, the Fed Now app, right, that has complete transparency and control. So they've got to show momentum somehow, some way. And I believe that's what's happening. Because, Seth, if, if you ask around, if I ask around, not many people have much money in the banks to withdraw, right? They, they don't. So where's all this money being pulled out of the bank coming from? It's stuff that we haven't really have in our hands anyways. It's, it's money that the Fed has injected into the banking system over the years, and they're just pulling it out. The banks aren't lending it to people anyways. So really, that, that impact is not going to impact consumers all that much, in my opinion. It's ultimately going to really hurt the banks as they have no capital anymore to lend. And even if they wanted to, the Fed doesn't let them have it, right? Because they're, they're future casting, going down the road and saying, this, this economy doesn't look good, paper money's going away. But the more that these things decline, the quicker we can get our end game way, which is central bank digital currency because it's complete command and control. So I think all of this appears and I hate to be Mr. Conspiracy Theory guy, but to me, it's not really a conspiracy. Not when the dots line up so well, is they're, they're dramatically impacting the system in a negative way to pull paper money out because you can't tax paper money. You can't control people with paper money, but you can with digital. So in the finance world, for anything to be born, something else needs to die. And this is what's dying is paper-based money creation via the central bank that we've been used to since the early 1900s that's dying in exchange to give birth to a central bank digital currency, which is all about command and control, knowing everything that you spend on everything. That's the world that we're headed into. And so you, know, you mentioned the M2 money supply and, and that you know, made me think of this article and I mentioned this kind of getting into this, but this is something that I'm just going to read through some of this because my jaw hit the floor when I came across this. And this is, okay, let's, let's dive in. So U.S. government may freeze American bank withdrawals as currency panic and capital flight mounts. This is from the macro guru, Hugh Hendry. So I'm going to read a little bit of this for the folks because this is, this is so important. Like This is so important. So hedge fund manager and macroeconomic expert, Hugh Hendry, just issued a major warning on the U.S. banking system and the American economy as a whole. In a new interview on Bloomberg Markets, Henry says mass panic and capital flight away from the U.S. banking se sector is entirely justified. He says a further decline in the M2 money supply, which in part tracks money in liquid checking accounts, could convince the U.S. government to step in and prevent citizens from taking their capital out of the banking system. He says, quote, sometimes it's kind of relevant to panic. I would recommend you panic. You've seen the biggest waterfall decline in M2 right now. M2 is deposits, not loans. That's the deposits fleeing the system and going into money market funds. Uh, that could reach a crescendo where the Treasury and the Fed may have to come in and actually restrict your right as a U.S. citizen to pull money out of the U.S. banking sector. It continues, Henry, Henry says capital flight from the U.S. banks is not solely about fears on whether the FDIC will ensure deposits above 250K and a blanket guarantee on deposits would not solve the problem. He says, quote, there is capital flight, deposit flight from the banking sector seeking yield. I fear that, I don't say this lightly, but in 1934, the Federal Reserve Act confiscated gold from U.S. citizens. 
we're at the point where the Fed and Treasury officials, I'm sure, are having to consider a gate a, a gate lock on unite on the U.S. bank deposits. So, I mean, we've we've talked about balance, right? We've you know, we've talked about the idea that you know, in in order to save this banking system, that they might seize some of your money and and kind of put it towards the you know kind of bailing out the the banks, right? As you saw happen in Cyprus. But this is a yeah. whole different thing because this is something like if there's one trend I've seen the past couple of years, especially under Joe Biden, it's that the federal government and the, the federal agencies are really pushing the limit on the amount of control they're willing to exert on, on we the people and how much they're willing to shred the Constitution. And so I right. could see them. I mean, look, we saw them saying shut down your restaurants, you know, social distance, wear a mask. It's for your own safety. We're protecting you. I could see them saying, you know what, we're going to temporarily, we're going to restrict and limit your bank withdrawals because if you overdo it, it's going to collapse the banking system. So we're going to protect you. I mean, I mean, when I, when I, sh- when I showed this to you, what are your thoughts on this? Well, so my thoughts are, we don't have to look much farther back than even what happened in Zimbabwe. Um, I'm sorry, not Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe was a hyperinflation, which they had to limit people's withdrawals, right? But again, people had no money. It's like good grief when they have over. Forty dollars a month instead of forty dollars a week, which is what Nigerians need to survive on. They limited the withdrawals to forty dollars a month, but they forced that issue on people. Why did they do that? Well, it wasn't because they really cared about people taking money out of the bank. It's because they wanted to control them, and only 05 percent of that population actually wanted central bank digital currency. Well, by the time they were done forcing the issue, you had sixty percent adoption rate. Why did they do? they starved out their population said, unless you agree to the central bank digital currency thing, we're just not going to give you enough money to live on. We'll only give you $40 a month instead of $40 a week. Well, man, that's, that's living on 25% of what you normally have. It's a loss of 75%. When you can't get that out of the bank and they're saying, you, you gotta, you gotta deal with what we tell you you're going to do and live on it. And you're going to be happy about it. Right? Well, it's like, well, what if I'm not? What if what if I need more than forty dollars a week? Well, in what's Nigeria? crazy, Kirk, is is like ten years ago, I would have looked at that story and said, "Well, yeah, that's Africa. Like that would never happen here in America. It would have been so easy right. to write it off and say, well, yeah, that's Africa, right?' But now, you know, I I would honestly like I wouldn't be surprised if we saw our own government and our own Federal Reserve attempt to you know pull the same kinds of uh, shenanigans here in the United States. It's sad to say that, but it's it's how I it, it's how I truly feel. Well, I agree. I mean, none of us want that. Americans, we want a strong dollar. We want this to be strong and so we can move forward with confidence and invest with confidence, but politicians don't even know what's going on. These these international non-governmental organization agreements have nothing to do with Congress. Right, they have nothing to do with anything except that they can get the bill passed by Congress, and the bill might say, "Hey, uh, we're just going to use stimulus money. We're going to use money that's printed out of thin air, maybe, um, which is which are just bank deposits issued by Chase. They they rubber stamp the back of the check, say, hey, before we even deposit it, slip this money over into the Fed at, at the Federal Reserve, you know, one of their big banks, because we don't want it." We don't want it in the system or, I mean, this is, this is such a prevalent thing happening right now. I believe full on that there's another bank run coming because they simply don't have liquidity. And then to even give out a loan right now is insane. I was talking to a client this morning and they were wondering what to do with their money. They said they're going to, they have to refinance their home somehow as was their exact words were. And it's like, what do you mean somehow? said, well, we can't get a loan because our FICO score isn't high enough. It's like FICO score is right. It's like never, never had a missed payment, 
you know, you're living within your means, well, you might not get a very good FICO score there. Your monthly payment every single month without skipping a beat. I mean, this is where we're headed, where even on a credit card, which we're used to them knowing everything that you buy and sell because you get the this you know information sheets, a bunch of separation of, of payments based on every payment that you make that's going into the S&P 500 or the Dow. Those days are numbered, right? Those days are numbered. And ultimately, they're not going to let you do that. They're just going to say, all right, you've got to bail out your own currency system, right? Just, just give money to the bank. And then we're going to make sure that you get everything else that you need that you paid your whole life in to get. So this is where I see it coming is even on the federal side, you're going to start to see draconian measures that really just want to destroy the faith and confidence that you have in the U.S. stock market so they can usher in their own way of living. Because it's going to be hard to defeat people now when, when it's actually bad, but it's not horribly bad. You can still have a good time at Disney, right? But but it's really getting bad. And so we don't want to, we don't want to participate in that. We don't want to participate in anything that is going to show a huge, massive negative profit. Give me a break. That's where we can thrive and keep people in the right place at the right time. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and I think that's something that, you know, look, I'm, I'm obviously not a financial guy. I don't have a, a PhD in economics, but I'm trying, you know, I'm, I'm piecing it all together and you know, I'm really stringing together the overall narrative. Mm. And I think that, you know, what I'm seeing with this is that, okay, what is the root cause? Well, I, I think in many ways it's, it's the, the sovereign debt crisis, right? It's like going yeah. back and I just, you know, I just interviewed uh, Martin Armstrong, right? We just had that, that interview and he talked about this and saying that basically, you know, like in 2008, it was the it was the mortgages, right? So the banks that were tied up in these mortgage backed securities, they're the ones that collapse. But like right now, it's the treasury, right? It, it's it's the it's the the sovereign uh, money, right? It's the central banks. I mean, it, it's like at the very core of the system. It's almost like before maybe you had skin cancer on your arm in 2008, and they could remove that skin cancer, right? And the rest of your body is mm -hmm. okay except for that that one area. Whereas now it's like the cancer is in the bones of the entire system and there's no way yeah. to remove it because it's at the very core of the system. And, you know, when Martin Armstrong, when I was asking about this and he said, he said that been describing the scenario that he, you know, what he thinks is coming next will make the great depression look like a dress rehearsal. That was just mind blowing, but it's always crazy because I find that a lot of times when I'm speaking to a particular expert that other people like independently will come to those exact same uh, conclusions. And so we just had, this was um, just today, this article came out, this is from uh, Peter Schiff, an article that was, uh, you know, talking about this. So here, this on zero hedge, Peter Schiff, great depression 2.0 is incoming. So Peter was on Jesse Kelly's show recently. They're talking about inflation, what it means. And, it's like, oh, the CPI is only 4.9%, right? It's not 5%, like we we're concerned. It's it just, it's mind boggling. But there's something I want to get into in this because Peter said some really important things that I think highlight exactly where things are at. So he said that the crisis is going to come in the form of a sovereign debt and currency crisis. He said, quote, so much worse than just the garden variety financial crisis that we had in 2008, because this time it's not just going to be subprime mortgages that are the problem. It's going to be the U S treasury debt. That's the problem, right? Nobody is going to want to own our sovereign debt because of how high inflation is. And that's also going to create a dollar crisis. There is where we're heading and it's a big disaster. And he continues and says, in asking about whether, you know, Jesse asked him, is this going to be like the Great Depression? He said, it's probably going to be worse. It's a depression. But unlike the Depression in the 1930s, where the people at least got the benefit of falling prices that provided some relief, during the Depression, you lost your job, but at least the cost of living went down. If you didn't lose your job, you were actually better off because you had your paycheck and your paycheck went further because consumer prices fell during the 30s. But this time... Even the people who don't lose their jobs are going to suffer because they're going to lose the value of their paychecks. They're going to lose the value of their savings. 
because everything that you need to buy is going to be a lot more expensive. And that's going to compound the burden for the unemployed because not only are they going to be without their jobs, but their savings are going to be destroyed. And even if they get checks from the government, it's not going to be enough to afford the basic necessities. So, I mean, like what Peter said in that just then, especially talking about the, you know, uh, sovereign debt crisis, it's almost word for word, almost exactly what Martin Armstrong said. And it's really, it's what you've been saying as well. Well, it's what both of us have been saying. I mean, this is the crazy thing about that. It, this isn't what Martin is saying and all these others, that this is not rocket science, right? We just have to connect the pieces. To me, it boils down to lowering wages, right? Plus rising cost of borrowing, plus rising debt equals bad economy. Because people aren't going to have as much money to spend, right? So that's that's the issue that we're dealing with. So when I hear people like Martin Armstrong and others who are actually shouting it from the rooftops, and he's not as much of a of a big, huge silver fan as a lot of us are, but yet he's going in with full steam ahead, right? Because he wants to see what his projections, I guess, will, will come to in, in light of the world that we're going to, because he's an amazing trends forecaster. Amazing. And what he's seeing is the cycle of wars now, cycle of conflict, right? And when you, what causes that? It's, it's a lot of times lack of food comes before that. Well, the, with the inflationary pressures, we don't have a lot of food, right? When you had the Arab Spring back in the day, what did Martin Armstrong say? Well, it's like, well, look what, look what's happening. You've got, you've got a food crisis in the Middle East and being angry, so to speak, is a real thing. Well, it is. When people can't afford to take care of their people in their own country, weird things start to happen, right? And it's this cycle of war. It's this economic cycle. It's a food shortage cycle. It's all of these cycles culminating into something that's bigger than anything that we've ever seen because it's not just a subprime lending bubble like we had in... 07 through 09. It's not just a tech stock bubble like we saw in 2000. It's literally an everything bubble. Everything that's grown because of borrowing and debt, which would be the stock market, the bond market, real estate, they're all going to come crashing down as this debt market implodes. And this is where we start to look at things like in in a completely different light. Like this isn't going to be a correction. This is going to be a collapse kind of a feeling. Because it's based on everything. Now you've got draconian measures that are being talked about. Um, ever since Janet Yellen, a couple of weeks ago, said, we're going to run out of money at the beginning of June. Well, she's talking about the debt ceiling, right? This happens every single year. So I don't want people to be alarmist about it. It's like, yeah, we, we basically have this conversation every single year. The end of the fiscal year, we are going to run out of money. So they raise the debt ceiling. They can talk and politically maneuver around it all the time, blame somebody else. I don't care what side of the political aisle you're on, you always raise the debt ceiling. They always do. But that adds more to the end game, which is all of that money, very inflationary. It's going to tear us apart because people don't have enough money to spend. So now what? When there's not enough money to spend and people aren't working and wages are coming down, they're not paying into Social Security which is why Janet Yellen says, we're going to run out of Social Security in 10 years. 10 years, it's no longer going to be there. It goes insolvent. So what are they talking about now? Policymakers in America. The same exact thing that the policymakers in France did, raised the age of benefits to get it out of Social Security or reduce the amount of payments that you get or a combination of both. Raise the age, reduce the benefits, now you kick the can down the road another five to 10 years, right? But, but this is going to be very devastating. They're not even going to keep up with cost of living adjustments. They're not going to keep up. And, and so, but they've hit this point of, well, we got to try to save the system from implosion for everybody. So therefore, we'll just put austerity measures in. You know, you, you don't get to access the benefits for another few more years. Um, or, or when you do get your benefits, it's going to be less not just due to inflation, because they're physically maybe cutting the benefits officially, not just due to inflation, right? But officially, 
Those are what austerity measures are. And this is what policymakers in America are talking about. The same thing that's causing riots and looting in France right now, which is simply raising the age of retirement. They're talking about the same thing here. Exactly. Or you could also just get rid of some of the population, which maybe that's also in their in their playbook. Well, <laughs> Perhaps. that's in their playbook. We've seen it. We've yeah. read it. I, yeah. My commencement speech when I graduated with my master's degree from the University of Denver, Senator Tim Worth was our commencement speaker. And he was one of the biggest proponents of global population reduction in, in, in the Senate at the time. It's like, wait a second. This is supposed to be a happy day. We're graduating. You're saying, yeah, we need to get the total birth population down to 500 million people. It's like, what? The whole earth? I mean, that's just a couple hundred million more than America. What about China and India and everyone else? I mean, this is their thing. But, oh, you have to have that. If you've now got computers that are replacing people's jobs because they don't want people to go to the government for unemployment benefits or handouts or welfare because their jobs are never coming back because the computer just took it. Yeah, all of this plays into that system, Seth, of population reduction. Um, you don't have to pay for computers, so why not hire a computer? There's no benefits, and you're not going to get sued by one, right? They're going to make this look amazing, but everything that we see, in fact, when I, I've i already seen this with my, with my own eyes. When, when we were flying to Miami for the Clay Clark event, went into the United Club room, and they usually have people that are picking up people's plates and everything. They now had computerized robots rolling around in the room with a trash receptacle on, on top saying, you know, put your plates in here. They already got rid of the people, right? And it's like, how sad. How sad that it, and I just saw it, right? It's like, oh my word, this is what we've been talking about. People are already re being replaced by robots and computers. And it's like, it's not going to end, which means what is going to end is the monetary system as we know it, right? Because you can't afford, you can't afford what's coming with nobody making wages because you don't have to pay a computer to raise, to get income tax revenue. They're, so everything they're talking about has this horrible flip side to it. Yeah, everything we're going to do is going to cost a ton of money. But, oh, yeah, we're not going to have as much coming in because we don't have people working because we replace them with computers. And there's no income tax revenue from those dumb, dumb computers. This is the world that we're living in right now. It, it really is. And so it, I have a few questions for you. know, But I want to bring up something that Martin Armstrong said where he kind of like as he saw this collapse unfolding, it was a collapse more of the government, you know, you know, kind of tied central bank tied assets, and that he saw people fleeing more into the private assets, right? Like pulling your money out of a bank and putting it into, um, you know, land or even the stock market. And so he saw that as the government assets collapse, that the other items and a lot of the other commodities would be increasing. And so you know, there's a lot of people that are watching this and they're, they're looking at this thinking, okay, all right, well, we've got, you know, Peter Schiff as one person. You know, there's a lot of people saying that, okay, we're heading into something that could be and will most likely be worse than Great Depression. Okay, what do we do? We've got uh, tech layoffs, right? We're already seeing massive tech layoffs, which is one of the early indicators of what's going to be happening with the economy. As they say right here, according to data compiled, that the running total of tech layoffs to date is 190,000 for this year, uh, surpassing last year's total of 164,000. So we're already way past last year's, not even halfway through the year. So people are seeing the indicators, right? People are seeing this unfolding. And now I know that, you know, I, I kind of talk about a lot of things. I talk about land, I talk about food, et cetera. Um, you're in the precious metals industry, you're in gold and silver. And so why is it amidst all this turmoil, why is it that you're saying, hey, this is the safe haven, you know, like taking that money out of the, you know, like Peter Schiff saying, like him saying that you're going to lose your savings. What's that mean? And what happens? Like, why are you saying, hey, put some of your savings into silver? Well, because this isn't a normal recession slash depression, like the Great Depression, right? Which normally prices come down to stimulate people buying, right? To start the, the economy headed up again. 
This one's different because they can do that. They're printing money like there's no tomorrow to try to stimulate the economy. That causes inflation and prices to go up, not come down. But so that's the inflationary part. But what they're responding to, a recession is a business cycle. thing. It's, it's how many people are working, how many people are buying stuff, right? That's what the recession talks about. And so you've got fewer people working, so fewer people can buy, but and everything that they are buying has higher prices. That's stagflation, and that's the, the worst possible scenario for a policymaker. But that's the world that we're going into. We are not going into Great Depression-style depression. We're going into more akin to Weimar Republic Germany hyperinflationary depression, where nobody's working, but they're printing money to get out of it. And, and see, the reason why we are going into recession depression because nobody's working. That article that you just referenced, what else does it say in there? 20% of, of Shopify is being laid off. Dropbox is cutting their employees by 16%. 3M, not even a tech company, is laying off 6,000 people, right? Uh, so that's that's big. Lyft, you know, the, the competitor to, to Uber, is laying off 26% of its workforce. IBM owned Red Hat 4% of its workforce. Gap uh, is laying off 1,800 employees. Bed Bath & Beyond filed for Chapter 11. Facebook laid off about 10,000 while closing an additional 5,000 open job opportunities on, on the job search boards. Um, so, and then Amazon is laying off a ton like, uh, I don't even 19, know how many. 19,000 or 2.5% of its workforce, right? Sirius XM, 475 people. Dell, 6,650 positions. I mean, this is, this is insane. This is when Biden tells us that the economy is growing and they have this thing under control. Don't listen to a politician say that, because in all of this, in all of this, the unemployment rate went from 3.6% to 3.5%. How could the unemployment rate get better when all these jobs are being laid off? Something's not adding up, right? Well, I'll tell you why it's not adding up, because they fudge with the numbers. If you are so discouraged, Seth, that you stopped looking for work, let's say you lost your job and you're, you're hitting the sidewalks, sweating, knocking on every door saying, please,
You're not financing it. You're not leveraging it. Those things go through the roof during times of inflation. Things that need to be financed. five three nine zero zero because kirk's got a great team and if that's something that you th if you've been thinking about it and you know you're on the fence you just take that that next step because even I, I, this is what i was telling someone, someone lately even if you have a few ounces of silver put aside you're already way better off than probably 98 percent of the american population that doesn't hold any precious metals so even just that little bit really could be significant. It's like, you know, some of the other countries, I think it was Argentina or I think it was Argentina I was talking to someone after their currency collapsed, or perhaps it was Venezuela. It was one of those, the, the countries that, um, you know, at that point, a wheelbarrow of cash would be required to buy a chicken, yet an ounce of silver could pay for a family of four or family of five. It could pay for their food, their needs for the entire month. Like that's just what happens when that, you know, unfolds. Amen. <laughs> Couldn't have said it any better myself. But that's where you can have a smile on your face, even though our freedoms and way of life are eroding, because not everything will go away with your freedoms. Your finances can thrive. You just have to be in the right place at the right time. Exactly. And so folks, those uh, the phone number and the links are also in the description. So uh, Kirk, again, it's always a pleasure having you on. It's like talking to an old friend. And uh, I, I appreciate what you're doing. That's one thing actually I can tell you that a lot of people that I met at this reawaken event and talking, a lot of them, as I mentioned, mentioned you and they just like, they thanked me as they look, I've learned so much about money and the economy. Like before I had no idea about these things, but you know, Kirk, you consistently coming on here has really helped educate a lot of people. Cause I think that it's not by chance that a lot of us are very financially illiterate. Like they've designed it like that. They don't want us to know how these things work. They want us just to kind of follow what the 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 mainstream advisor tells us to do because then we're we're still always trapped within their debt trap. And I think this is one of the ways out of it they don't want us to do, right? It's exactly right. They don't want us to know the options because the government wants us to be if they're economic and indebted to them slave, right? So they're not gonna tell us the truth. They're just going to tell us, come to us for help. Don't do it through the private sector. Don't go to your bank. And they're making it so we can't go to the bank so we can go directly to them. Right. So don't do that. Don't do that because there's options. Just give us a call and we'll help you through it and, and set up a true strategy for success moving forward to keep you in the right place at the right time, the majority of the time and take advantage of these trends, right? Because they can, there's a lot of advantage to be taken as some things go down in markets like this, some things go up. Gold and silver, that not only do they go up, they're actually going through the roof. And that's what we want to take advantage of. Well, thank you so much, Kirk. Thanks to you again. Take, have, have a wonderful day. My pleasure. We'll see you.